morning to you all and uh, we are um, we are discussing a very interesting uh, paper today in, as part of our fellow seminar uh, a paper which um, uh, kabir uh, tanija here did with uh, a colleague in nanyang technological university singapore and uh, it's of course uh, on the islamic state a presence in, Indi in, in, in the Indian state of Kerala, and uh, what are the policy implications and the underlying factors that are driving that presence. Uh, so in some ways, uh, this takes the conversation on, uh, on Islamic State, ISIS, forward in India. Uh, we have done a lot of work. We track it um, on a regular basis. Um, and uh, we are, I think, uh, focusing uh, in this paper very specifically on Kerala, given a critical role that uh, if you look at the numbers, we have Kerala dominating um, the presence. So it's an, it, it's an interesting, it, was an, it, it is an interesting exercise uh, that this paper has done. And um, of course, many of you would know Kabir. Uh, he's virtually now called as Mr. Isis in India because, he's, because of his work on the, on the topic. Uh, his book is coming out or has already come out, um, and The Isis Peril by Penguin India. Uh, which, uh, which is out there in the market. Yeah. So it will be out in the market this weekend, um, and it will be launched later in the next few weeks. Uh, but this paper is, uh, is very specifically about the presence of uh, Islamic State in Kerala, uh, and along with uh, Mohammed Sinan CH, who is a research analyst at uh, Nanyang Technological University, this paper has been written. Uh, so I will let Kabir uh, do the talking first, and then we, will, uh, we have some Panel will come to, uh, later. We have a very uh, interesting panel here to talk about, to respond to some of the uh, questions and issues raised in this paper. Uh, so let me now, um, both Maria is well known. Uh, she works with New York Times, and Adil works with IDSA, Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. Uh, and we will have their comments um, after the two authors have presented uh, their side and their version of their findings. So Kavi, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor Pan, and thanks everyone for turning up today. Uh, what, which is uh, for um, it's quite a niche topic. Uh, we've read a lot, we've seen a lot, we've heard a lot about the Islamic State in the past four or five years, and uh, yeah, this paper is a continuation of some of the work that we've been doing at the Observer Research Foundation on this issue over the past year, year and a half. Uh, we've done a monograph that came out uh, last year. Um, uh, which uh, was a culmination of uh, three occasional papers at ORF, uh, which dealt with uh, uh, the Islamic State in general, the Islamic State in the region, which is South Asia, and the Islamic State in India as well, and its influence in India. So uh, this, in this paper, we, of course, went uh, uh, much more niche, uh, uh, looked at one of what is perceived to be a problematic uh, region, comparatively problematic region, as I'll tell you in the, uh, in the ensuing few minutes, that uh, over, um, from a broader perspective, it's, it's, it's not even an issue, uh, for, especially from a regional or a global perspective. Uh, uh, so I'll just start with, uh, first and foremost, of course, this is a very difficult pa paper to present. It's very, um, uh, it's a bit heavy, and it, 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 it has a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, sections and subsections uh, dealing with historical context and so societal issues and uh, cultural context, so on and so forth. Uh, and my colleague would, uh, uh, who's joining us from Singapore will uh, get into that uh, in, in, in over the next couple of minutes. Uh, but let's just start with, of course, um, some of the basics that we uh, did cover in, in our, some of our previous works. Uh, a lot has happened since then as it uh, it has been in the world of the Islamic State. It, uh, it's both um, progression and degeneration uh, move very rapidly. Um, uh, since this paper was published, the uh, self-declared caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed in northern Syria. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Islamic State has lost 99% uh, of its territory. It's been declared uh, as having been defeated by the United States. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there are, of course, 100 other questions that have come with it. Uh, what happens to all the fighters that are part of the Islamic State? What are the, uh, what are the global institutions where they can be tried? Uh, which countries are responsible for which, uh, which of their foreign fighters? How are countries going to deal with foreign fighters? 
Um, Europe is dealing with this question significantly these days. Uh, as we've heard, uh, Turkey is trying to repatriate a lot of foreign fighters that are in uh, camps uh, in northern Syria and, and in Turkey, trying to send them back to their uh, country of origins in, in Europe, and a lot of these countries are refusing to uh, to take them back at this point of time. So there are a lot of, lot of issues that have uh, come across from the defeat of Islamic State as, as well. Uh, no easy answers uh, available, of course, uh, at the moment. Uh, but, uh, the, the, but, the, but the topic behind the discussion uh, continues, to, continues to grow. Uh, so, uh, of course, from 2014, uh, from uh, the start of the uh, so-called caliphate to 2018, uh, 27, 2018, where uh, you know, it, it all started from the Al-Nuri Mosque in, in Mosul. We saw the fall of the Al-Nuri Mosque as well in Mosul uh, when the Islamic State destroyed it while trying to escape. Um, so uh, that is just, just a brief sort of um, uh, all-encompassing uh, take on, on where we are regarding regarding the issue, regarding the group, and regarding the regional uh, dynamics of that group in the Middle East. Uh, so very quickly, I will uh, uh, jump geographies. Uh, I will come to uh, uh, the ISIS influence in India. Uh, according to, the, so the ORF started uh, the, uh, the ISIS tracker program in 2017 end, if I remember correctly. Uh, the whole point was to try and, uh, since it was a very limited number of uh, cases that were coming out, uh, but the global implications of the Islamic State were still up for question, we started to track these cases, um, uh, both uh, the cases that were being reported um, in the media and by law enforcement agencies. Um, we came to a total number of around 180. Uh, uh, and that is that shows you that uh, the direct influence or actionable influence and that took place in India under the under the garb of the, in the Islamic State it, it was very minimal compared to the population of the country. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, the Ministry of Home Affairs in, uh, in India places the number of cases at around 155. But uh, we've seen a variation in these numbers over the past couple of months, uh, specifically in the media. It goes from 134 to 145 to 155 sometimes. Uh, and that shows you that there, there are problems in these areas. And there, is, uh, there needs to be more uh, 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 assertive uh, uh, work on, the, on these issues. Uh, and of course, uh, I'll quickly go to Kashmir is something that comes up whenever you discuss Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, anything, any of these other groups. Uh, uh, I think from directly from Kashmir, there may be just two or three cases as far as Islamic State is concerned. Uh, a couple of cases, of course, were more of a, a attention-seeking practice than uh, actually setting up an ecosystem that is loyal to the Islamic State. But of course, one thing that has happened is is is, is the advent of do-it-yourself terror, which is uh, you can do something, can commit an act of terror, and uh, claim it in the name of an organization. And the organization is usually quite happy to, to accept your claim. And overnight, you can become part of that organization. So uh, again, very quickly moving to, to Kerala. Um, uh, we've seen, uh, of course, um, a lot of Indian states have seen sporadic cases of pro-ISIS activity. And it's very important to make sure that uh, in the context that we're talking about Islamic State in India, or even in most South Asian countries, uh, the, the tag pro-ISIS is, is, is a more apt one. Because there is very, it's very difficult to ascertain whether an actual hierarchical structure or an organization structure that is uh, not just close to the Islamic State, but is also accepted by the Islamic State, exists in India. In our uh, studies over the past one and a half to two years, I have not seen such any such thing. We have seen various reports in the media that have claimed that there has been a declared caliph above for West Bengal, or there has been a declared caliph for in northern Kerala, so on and so forth. Uh, but there have been no official uh, uh, proclamations by the Islamic State, state towards, these, towards these people. Someone, but that shows you the power of the brand and the power of the name that holds today. If someone goes up to a wall in West Bengal, and this happened, uh, writes down that the new caliph for ISIS West Bengal is X, Y, Z, um, and that media report comes out, gets circulated fairly fast, thanks to the internet, the wire services, so on and so forth. 
and suddenly everyone is uh, talking about a caliph in, in, uh, or an emir in, in, in West Bengal. And there was no such thing. So this, this new era of, of course, uh, creating, uh, sorry, non-existent ecosystems is something that both the public discourse in understanding terror is struggling with, but also more importantly, perhaps law enforcement is struggling with. Uh, so as, uh, I'll very quickly move to, move to Kerala. And um, uh, I won't go into too many details. As I, as I said, it's a very difficult uh, paper to present. But if you go through it, you'll find, find most of the stuff that I'm going to very briefly touch upon. Uh, most cases came from Northern Kerala for demographical reasons, of course, mostly, um, uh, but also for uh, historic migrational and cultural reasons. Uh, the direct uh, uh, relations between the people of Northern Kerala uh, and uh, the West Asian region in general uh, have been there for decades, if not centuries. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the, uh, we all know about the people-to-people -people movement between the two regions. We all know the remittance movement between the two regions. And that shows you the depth of the relationship between, between uh, that part of India and, and West Asia. Uh, there was only one major case of mass movement that happened in Kerala uh, in the name of the Islamic State, uh, uh, where around 20, 21 people uh, many of them from uh, from the same family uh, uh, moved lock, stock, and barrel to uh, to Afghanistan in the name of Islamic State. Uh, they uh, uh, th some of them were uh, claimed to have been killed in the American uh, uh, mother of all bombs attack that happened in 2017 or 2018. One of those two, and uh, whether they were they were not. I mean, it's it's it's, it's very difficult to difficult to judge. But of course, before that, they, uh, they were in touch with their families. Uh, they were in touch. They were in regular touch with their families. The families tried to step in. They tried to reason. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, uh, they pushed uh, uh, these people to try and tell them to come back, to give yourselves up, and this is not the correct path, so on and so forth. It didn't work out very well. Uh, uh, in, in that aspect. And the reasons for this particular radicalization, I think, was quite different to uh, uh, the other cases that came up in India. Uh, most of the other cases were of individuals. Uh, this was more of a, uh, more of a uh, group outcome. Um, and if you just go through the paper, you'll see much, a few more details on it. Uh, so this was, the, this was the case that actually uh, created more ruckus than most other cases. Most other cases were, of course, from Northern Kerala again, about a single person maybe watching a propaganda video or a single person talking to another person, trying to radicalize another person after watching something online or getting in touch with someone online. Um, during the uh, period of 2014 to 15, Facebook was a big driver of these discussions. Uh, this is, of course, before the tech platforms were literally forced to uh, up their game against uh, con terror content online. Uh, and uh, if you go back through some of the court records, you go back through some of the media reports or people who we talk to as well, uh, uh, it, there is, of course, there is a, there's a conception that it was uh, the internet that radicalized them. I think that's a fairly wrong approach to go with. A lot of these people were already on the cusp of radicalization. <laughs> the internet is just an enabler. So um, uh, a lot of these cases, of course, uh, came out from Kerala. I think around 35 to 40 out of the 160, 170 odd cases on average came out uh, from, from Kerala. And of course, that sh that's shown a light that perhaps the region, there's something happening there. Perhaps we are missing something out. Uh, perhaps uh, the community outreach has been wrong by the law enforcement, so on and forth, so forth. Like a lot of questions were raised, very few answers given. Uh, but overall, again, it's, it, it, it is only 40 cases. It, it wasn't, we've seen more cases coming out of Belgium, I think, or, or France, or m many more cases by hundreds. So again, it was not deemed, or it is not deemed correctly as a major problem, but it is, of course, something of a red flag that needs to be, that needs to be taken, uh, needs to be looked into. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, uh, the basic subscription to ideology in most of these cases was already there. Uh, and was a common factor. Uh, uh, no one saw a propaganda video and became radicalized overnight. Uh, the tendencies of thought were al already there. As I said, the internet was an enabler and, uh, and, and, and a medium. Uh, a lot of content that people saw online, which was pro-Islamic state, which was being, dis um, uh, being um, 
distributed was also language specific, I think which is very important. Uh, it was not all in English, it was tailor made for audiences. So you clearly know that uh, whoever was making these strategies uh, uh, on, uh, for Islamic State for South Asia, especially this region, knew what they were doing and were possibly from the same region as well. Um, uh, and one thing that was very different between a lot of the cases that came out of Kerala uh, specifically, uh, and which is also common to all most cases that came out of India in general, uh, was that people who were radicalized or wanted to join the Islamic State did not want to commit attacks domestically, or were not interested beyond a point to commit dom domestic attacks. They wanted to travel and live in the caliphate. The, ide the idea of them being living in that land that was sold to them as being pious and being pure and you know uh, live under uh, under sharia and so uh, so on and so forth that was the driving force for them to actually join the islamic state it was not to pick up a knife or commit a lone wolf attack as we saw saw in europe um, even if you see a lot of the online chatter from uh, from the indian uh, cases uh, most of them were actually, of course, discussing theology, discussing ideology, so on and so forth, but they were also looking for validation. They were looking for validation from peers who were thinking similar things, and, but more importantly, if they did not find that validation, there were cases where people just stopped talking about these things online or just took a step back, uh, went back to family, went back to office, or so on and so forth. So. Uh, Quite, quite, quite a lot of differentiation between the cases that we saw here and how we, the cases we saw in the Middle East, the cases we saw in Southeast Asia, the cases we saw in Europe. So, uh, of course, the Islamic State's ideology is a common, common factor, but how it is interpreted uh, and what people want to do with it was a different ballgame altogether. Uh, so yeah, just quickly, as I said, we, uh, Northern Kerala, we, there were three to four main districts that we saw these cases from. And of course, there's one very important part that we also mentioned in the paper. Uh, all these districts, districts are usually well to do. Uh, poverty is not a, it's, it's, poverty is a bogey argument anyway, but it, it's more clear than ever in Northern Kerala specifically because uh, it, um, majority of uh, people, majority of families at least have someone or know someone who works in the Middle East. And remittances, as I said, is a big part of it. So uh, uh, just saying, and uh, in Northern Kerala in itself, if I remember correctly, maybe Sinan can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, has four international airports that connects the Gulf very well. So clearly, there, because the economy can sustain such travel, the, you have the infrastructure for, the, for such travel, which makes it, of course, which made it very hard for the Indian uh, law establishment in the beginning, so 13, 14, to recognize what the threat is. And they were, uh, they were a little late to uh, start countering it at some level, specifically on uh, travel surveillance. Uh, so I will, I will not go into the history and local culture and societal issues. Sinan is going to handle that. Um, uh, as I said, most people were not interested in, in, join, in acting in the name of Khilafat here. They wanted to travel and join ISIS there. Uh, one thing, of course, we came uh, uh, to an understanding is that if the problem is within a community, so is the solution. Uh, I'll just expand on this point very briefly, is that India's general counter-terror thinking is uh, correctly, perhaps, or you can't blame the thinking to be that way, is heavily influenced from its experiences in Kashmir. Uh, a lot of implementation of those processes of counter-terrorism or thinking of counter-terrorism sort of is counterproductive in other theaters of conflict. Uh, it's, if, you, if you try to implement the same approach to counterterrorism as you have in Kashmir, uh, in a place like Northern Kerala, uh, it's your, your results are going to be very lopsided, uh, both within the community and uh, law enforcement-wise as well. Um, now, very quickly, I'll come to the, on the internet part because it's just widely discussed everywhere. Uh, as if, you know. Um, so uh, there's no doubt we know that Islamic State propaganda was uh, very well articulated and distributed. We can't deny that fact. They took on to language very well. They took on to uh, vernacular vert verticals very well. I think the first cases of uh, pro-ISIS propaganda in Tamil uh, was in 2012-13, which before even the caliphate was officially declared. So, uh, so that kind of ecosystem had started to build very, very early. And of course, both tech companies, law enforcement, so on and so forth, everyone missed the boat. 
uh, uh, and who is blamed, to blame for that. We can keep discussing that uh, forever. Uh, as I said, there was little to no initial response from the state as well. They saw the threat. They saw uh, that social media was being used as a driver for these for these conversations, but they had very little idea on how to actually approach it. A lot of these companies were not Indian. They were, uh, the, the, they were legal entanglements, they were surveillance entanglements, and they were uh, law enforcement entanglements, which took far too long to get addressed. Uh, as I said, pace of technology often defeats policy, and we saw that globally happening. It wasn't just an India case. Uh, uh, yeah, OK. Uh, and. Uh, I've covered all the next two parts, which is, of course, representing and legitimizing online systems. Online pra propaganda is an enabler and not necessarily why the person exclusively is radicalized. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, places, I think, where uh, a lot of other law enforcement agencies that acted a little faster uh, on Islamic State issues were that they recognized that the best place to insert themselves in as traditional agencies, not necessarily um, digital agencies, not the NSA or the GCHQ, is when uh, a person is thinking about something and acting about something. So uh, that movement between thought and action is a very critical period in uh, both countering ideologies and countering, uh, uh, and countering, uh, yeah, and countering uh, movement. So. Uh, yeah, so this my final point before I leave, uh, I move to Sinan. Uh, uh, of course, the death of Abu Bakr Agul Baghdadi has changed some things. Uh, what are those things? I have no idea, to be honest. But the new successors were announced. Uh, who they are, what they do, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the Islamic State changed a lot of our traditional counter-terror thinkings, our general thinkings of what terrorism is. Uh, Al-Qaeda was a comparatively conservative organization to what the Islamic State was. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said before, India's counter-terror th thinking needs to adapt much faster to what it had uh, done in, in 2013, 2014, to these new challenges. Uh, uh, and as I said, one of, the re one of the main issues that we need to address is uh, from, taken from uh, Indian Islamic State cases, is that your general uh, broad stroke counterterrorism policies uh, will give you very little results because every theater has a different uh, th a different fingerprint to it, and you need to adapt to that fingerprint. If you are going to uh, going to um, if your policy is just to cut off the hand, that's not going to really work. Uh, and uh, so, bridging government and civil society vacuum, specifically in theaters such as Islamic State, where online space is a very important space, uh, where you cannot police it very well ever. And you cannot police every house who's using what phone or who's on what website. The community aspect comes in in, in a very big way. So, and you need to be uh, you need by policy pay more attention to it from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, and finally, um, uh, I'll, uh, this new concept of the Islamic State that is the ICE has got in was, you know, moving away from the traditional you need God, you need to fight for God. Is that God needs you? Come here, come to us. So uh, a lot of this uh, uh, thinking was prevalent in, in, in Kerala, where people wanted to go, but, but were not so keen to stay and act in the name of Islamic State. And I think that posed a new kind of challenge. Of course, that, that saves you from, from uh, a general uh, action of violence. It's not for the lack of trying. The Islamic State tried uh, to set up ecosystem in, ecosystems in India using former Indian Mujahideen uh, uh, people. But of course, they failed. So uh, this is just a very quick uh, walk through to why this paper exists and what was found. Uh, as I said, it's difficult to uh, it's difficult to color all the arguments in here. Uh, but I will uh, go to Sinan very quickly, and uh, he will take you through some some, some points uh, of the piece.
Hi, Sinan, can you hear me? Perfectly. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay, uh, so the floor is yours. You can start your 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Um, so just to begin with, thank you to Ore for um, inviting me to write the paper along with Kabir. That's been a great experience right, working on this. And the second thing is that I cannot really see anybody. I'm only looking at myself. So um, I'm just looking at my phone to ensure that the connection is not lost. So just bear with me if anything of that sort happens. Right. Um, so to begin with, um, I'm assuming uh, Kabir gave an, uh, gave an introduction into what the Islamic State has done so far in India and how it's been so, uh, you know, how it has affected and influenced, uh, you know, events in India, right? Um, and or how less or how more of an influence it has been. So because of the interest in Kerala and because of the amount of people that have been highlighted that have specifically gone from Kerala, especially those two, three cohorts of maybe 20 people who travel to Afghanistan and places in uh, other places, other parts of um, Iraq and Syria, we thought it was important to look into this paper and, uh, you know, to understand why uh, Kerala specifically, right? And so for that, um, what we did was we went through three and the sections that I'm going to look at right now is the uh, three sections on history, on the reasons why people have been uh, involved in, uh, you know, in, in activities like foreign fighting activities in Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan from Kerala specifically. And also the last section being what sort of narratives, common narratives exist and are they actually true or do they have to be dispelled, right? So to begin, um, when we started off with the history of the uh, of the um, of the Maple Muslims, and and this is important to, you know, any study, right? So when we're looking at ISIS in India in general, I believe it's really important that we look at what is the history of uh, Hindu-Muslim relations in in a country and how, uh, you know, because when people say that ideology is important, then you look at what sort of ideological strains have existed over the last thousand years or so, because Islam has existed in India for a very long time. So specifically in Kerala. We do know that a lot of the Maple Muslims who had come in, um, the first Muslims came in in the seventh century, like or seventh or eighth century, and there are historical, you know, narratives that dispute uh, when exactly they came. But when they came in, they came in as traders, and they continue to work with most of the Hindu uh, rulers, the Zamurans and uh, the Cheru Perumals and so on and so forth, um, throughout uh, their time, throughout their presence in, in uh, Kerala. And then towards the 1400s, as soon as you had the Portuguese and other colonial um, you know, settlers coming in, there was a lot of economic fights that took place between both uh, the, the Mapilla Muslims as well as these uh, Portuguese, both of whom were seafaring uh, traders, right? And so political alliances formed, and then there was this major uh, disruption of, uh, you know, relations that took place, leading to anti-colonial struggles against both the Portuguese, but later on in, towards the French and the British as well. And so within that context, uh, post-independence, there was a movement, or pre-independence, there was a movement to include Kerala as part of, you know, the Pakistan, right? And so you had the Muslim League, which was active in Kerala, but then that that sort of dissipated because of so many reasons, because there was already a historic uh, great historic connection between Hindus and Muslims and also because of the fact that it was geographically impossible to really you know have uh, Kerala be a part of um, Pakistan and, and many other things and and ever since then with the you know the influx of Marxism and many other uh, influences that took place in Kerala there has been an identity that has been created in Kerala which has been extremely Malayali uh, extremely uh, Kerala so any any Indian can tell you or any anybody who's dealt with a lot of Keralaites can tell you that they could be best friends with um, a Kerala Muslim, but the moment they do end up meeting, um, they, they do like you know the Kerala Muslim meets another, or you know it could be any Kerala, right? But if they meet any other Kerala, somehow your bonds of friendship with this person reduces, and you know the Kerala suddenly just bonds really well with another um, uh, you know Kerala, and that's that's just the that's the way the identity of the Malayalis have been uh, created over times. So within this background, then we looked sort of as to what is the issues of online radicalization, right? I mean, uh, we as issues of radicalization and why people traveled, and some of the reasons we highlighted. And and bear in mind that this is a very limited study in that we were not able to interview the people who were arrested, nor were we obviously inter able to interview anybody who had traveled across. But we were able to get in all the reports and um, all sorts of media reports as well as you know communications that are available through open source about how these people who traveled to uh, Afghanistan and you know to join the so-called Daesh or the Islamic State, right? 
how they uh, thought or like what was some of the major points that they had put out right and what we realized is that there are four major factors that have uh, resulted in Keralaite Muslims specifically traveling abroad to these places so the first one is online radicalization now while there have been waves of uh, radical groups in India previously as well in the in the 90s with Simi and later on in the 2000s with uh, Indian Mujahideen um, with this and and Al Qaeda was never really able to like you know make inroads into India and I think uh, especially in this part of India and I think one of the reasons why ISIS has been able to work better is because they actually use the Malayalam language uh, in their uh, versions of online radicalization right and and like I said the Malayalam identity is important so to acknowledge that identity and then to bring that into propaganda is something that is uh, that has worked uh, or it did work to some extent um, the second aspect is also the issue of utopia and, and every uh, revivalist group every sort of radical group does at some point or the other harken back to a golden age and this has happened with like you know even uh, Andres Breivik and a lot of uh, far-right white extremists as well who talk about European golden ages during the 1400s and so on so in that sense even Muslims and especially you know people in this part of Kerala they did believe in this oh yeah okay like we need to go back to the seventh century where uh, you know the prophet was living in the perfect times and Muslims were at their best age and so on and and this is a sort of system that's taken root in many parts of the world among Muslims but uh, in Kerala this is you know one aspect that was specifically highlighted by a lot of Keralaite Muslims uh, who went over to Afghanistan and uh, and we be therefore believe that this was one major motivation uh, and in, in in that strain it's also important to realize that they didn't really plan attacks against the Keralaite government as much uh, you know as, as you would have seen in the case of Uttar Pradesh and you know in Maharashtra where there were uh, cases to bomb uh, or, or to poison certain uh, festival uh, you know food and so on and so forth right and lastly, I think the most important point has also been the ease of travel that, that is accorded to Keralaites. And as we all know, I mean, Kerala has a large number, almost 10% of its population has lived abroad and specifically in the Middle East uh, region. They are NRIs, they're not uh, na naturalized citizens in the Gulf countries. So because of that, there are almost four airports. I and mean, there are four airports right now in Kerala, which uh, serve internationally. That's the highest in any state that goes on and so uh, the fact is that they are able to travel easily because of this and that's why when you see so many Keralaites who have traveled they use these routes to go through um, you know the Qatar and to go through uh, the Emirates uh, you know and Saudi Arabia and so on to reach into um, into Afghanistan right but um, so these are the four reasons that we had uh, surmised. I mean, there there are more, but we weren't able to, you know, at least uh, isolate more reasons out of our own research. And, you know, this research is open to more, right? Because this is an introduction. But um, moving on to narratives, and this is something that, you know, a lot of like policy language is couched within certain narratives. And we wanted to question four narratives as well. So one is, is Kerala uh, and specifically Malpuram places like Malpuram, are they highly radical places, you know? Um, a lot of times people, and, and we believe that, you know, it's sometimes it's it's paranoia uh, because a lot of times people end up seeing social conservatism like wearing the niqab or like bigger beards as signs of radicalization, whereas that may not be the case. Uh, in fact, like my own discussions with people from Kerala and people from Malpuram as well, you know, they say that, yeah, sure, there is this, but there are also a growing number of people within bars in, in Kerala and, and it's not uncommon to see them. You see, so that's one aspect that we wanted to question. The second is, are intercommunal relations damaged? Uh, especially, and, and this leads into the next uh, uh, you know, point that we had, especially because of Saudi funding and, and the influx of Saudi-related uh, in Islam and so on. Um, I would say, and, and this has been from both personal experience as well as you know, a bunch of interviews and discussions that I've had with people in Kerala, uh, we sort of noticed that it's actually the case that inter, intra-religious uh, disputes have increased a lot more. So there are people, let's say for example, from the Kerala Nadwatul Mujahideen, which is the Salafist organization there, as well as you know, uh, parts of the uh, Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, or what they call themselves the Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, uh, there have been a lot of fights between them, just like how the Dioband would fight with Nadwa and like North India and so on, right? So the the influx of like um, Saudi Arabian funds and all of that has been a quite uh, a, a more you know it has damaged relations between in groups within the Muslims rather than between Hindus and uh, Muslims, right? And and so this is the last um, narrative that we wanted to question within this um, sort of you know within, within the paper that we did. So in essence, then um, I think and 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 
because this is an introductory paper, we believe there's a lot more work to be done, right? But at the same time, we would also like to, uh, one of the objectives of writing this paper and to write it in a specific way was to show that it's a multiplicity of factors. You have to consider operational ease as much as you look at ideology. In fact, maybe more in my opinion. Um, you have to look at historical factors as well and how that has acted either as a, a bulwark against radicalization or it has pushed and encouraged radicalization further. So, so history, uh, operational reasons, and you know, apart from that, the identity, all of these are factors that have to be considered when you are studying radicalization. And, and while it might be easy to gloss over these aspects, I think uh, these give answers that we don't normally tend to, you know, we, we, in, in, and they give us answers from places we don't normally expect. So that is um, you know, a brief insight from my side on this paper. Um, I will give the floor, and I hope I can listen to the rest of it so that I can answer questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sinan. Just stay with us, though. Yeah. Thank you, Kabir, and thank you, Sinan, for um, for outlining uh, the main points of this paper. And I think, uh, as you can see, though, it's it's a it's a slightly niche paper focusing primarily on Kerala's trajectory, Northern Kerala's uh, in particular. But I think it raises some of the fundamental questions about the sources of radicalization, proximate versus in, uh, underlying causes, whether you have uh, your counterterrorism policy right. Uh, the the, the uh, extent of, to which um, ISIS has uh, moved into uh, the Indian mainland, and what are the, what is you know what is the right approach to understanding it, even if, even if we are looking at a particular case like in this paper in uh, Kerala's case. So I think it raises a number of points, and I'm sure there'll be a, it will an interesting discussion would follow. Uh, let me give the floor to our two discussants, um, uh, Maria uh, uh, Abhi Habib, uh, Abhi Habib from uh, New York Times, a South Asia correspondent, has followed this issue quite closely. <laughs> so uh, Maria, floor is all yours. And then Thank you. Um, so I have followed this issue quite closely. In a previous life, I was um, I covered ISIS and Al Qaeda actually for five years at the Wall Street Journal before I came here and I joined the New York Times. Um, at the time, the Wall Street Journal was looking at the Arab Spring and said, I used to live in Afghanistan too. So I lived in Afghanistan for three years. And then I moved back to Lebanon, which is where I'm from, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And they said, well, Arab Spring is pretty crazy, but we're going to give you two beats that are kind of quiet. One is going to be terrorism, and one is going to be Yemen. <laughs> and lo and behold, ISIS formed about five months later. Um, so I, uh, I have been covering ISIS since it was founded. Um, as ISIS, uh, and I have covered Al Qaeda quite a bit. Um, I was in Baghdad when Mosul fell, and I was in Mosul when Mosul fell. Um, so I've I've covered quite a few nooks and crannies. Um, I've been to Tunisia to track down foreign fighters who've gone to Syria. I've been to Syria. I've been to Turkey, looking at the flow of uh, ISIS militants, Saudis coming off of planes. Never been on a plane before, I was on the plane next to them, and they promised me that they were going to southern Turkey to go for tourism. So, and there's nothing in southern Turkey, I don't know how many of you have actually been there, but there's not a lot going on in southern Turkey. Um, and then they would of course take a um, very well organized uh, bus across the border to join ISIS in Syria. So I guess um, Kabir's, uh, well the, the ORF, I mean both of your, uh, the paper has been very interesting because one thing when, when I was covering ISIS was, well where are all the South Asians? And there weren't that many South Asians. There were a few South Asians, but there weren't that many. Um, so that was, it's quite interesting to read kind of I think the first research paper on India and I mean the first I've come across at least so this was very valuable for us and I'm really hoping that they expand upon it because I think that this is a very fertile ground I think that what's happening in South Asia especially India um, I think is going to possibly be a recruitment hub going forward depending on challenges that could be maybe overcome by ISIS or Al Qaeda or whatever comes after them um, one thing that Kabir brought up is, well, what does Baghdadi's death mean? Um, I think that his death means very little. Uh, I was in Afghanistan when OBL was killed, OBL being Osama bin Laden. Um, and one thing that always kind of made me laugh in Afghanistan was that the US military would call me up and call up other reporters and say, we killed, we killed Al Qaeda's number two. And then sure enough, three months later, they'd call me again. We killed Al Qaeda's number two. You have to write about it. And be like, well, okay, this is great, you keep killing Al-Qaeda's number two, but then there was always another number two who comes along. 
Um, so I think that people tend to look at Al-Qaeda and ISIS kind of in parallel, and I think that one thing that led to not the death of Al-Qaeda, but Al-Qaeda losing prominence is ISIS. Um, ISIS was the sexier, quote unquote, terrorist organization. Um, and that's because um, for a lot of the reasons that are pointed out in the paper, their social media skills are amazing. Um, uh, they speak to people in their own language, um, whether it's Chechen or Albanian or um, you know, in various Indian dialects. <laughs> so they, and even, I mean, even being from the Middle East, I have to say that one of the tests that we would do at the Wall Street Journal was to see if someone's Arabic was really good, was sit them down with a um, Zarqawi, or not a Zarqawi speech, but with a um, Zawahiri speech, Al-Qaeda's uh, head. And if they could actually listen to the speech and understand it, then that meant that their Arabic was very good. And I have to say that even for fluent Arabic speakers, the language that Al-Qaeda was using was such ancient Arabic that a lot of fluent Arabic speakers couldn't even speak it. So when Zawahiri would be sitting outside of God knows where, surrounded by bushes, speaking in very archaic Arabic that nobody's used in, I don't know, 200 years. Along comes ISIS with like, you know, Hollywood type videos for recruitment, speaking in much simpler Arabic or speaking in your language, whether it's French or whatever it is. Um, and so that was, that was, that's ISIS's real true kind of weapon is their ability to capture minds online. So even though they've lost the physical state of the, the caliphates, right, which was once the size of the UK, they still occupy a space online that is unbeatable. And so this is not a threat that is any, by any means pacified with Baghdadi's death or the fact that they've lost territory in Syria or Iraq. Um, one thing that I thought was super interesting about the paper was they talk about how, Car how Carolyn Muslims are very, the sense of community is very important. One thing that we've really seen, whether it's lone wolf, quote unquote, lone wolf attacks in Jordan or lone wolf attacks in you know, Orlando, Florida. Um, uh, one thing we've seen is that we say lone wolf, like yes, you can go and you can become radicalized online and you can find, figure out how to make a bomb from things that you would find underneath your kitchen, for instance, although how powerful it is, who knows. Um, but there is the sense of community even around the lone wolf. So it's, for instance, the Orlando, Florida, the ISIS, um, the kid who, who, who gave Bayat to Baghdadi and then shot up the um, nightclub in Orlando. He was egged on by his girlfriend, actually. So he might have carried out the attack alone, hence lone wolf, but there's always a community, whether it's friends who are saying, yeah, that Baghdadi guy is so cool. <laughs> or you know, whatever it is. Um, there, there, there kind of tends to be a community around you that's kind of egging you on, right? And, and mirroring your, your thoughts. Um, so, so I think that as tensions here rise between Hindus and, and Muslims, I think that's something to watch out for. Um, and I think that uh, the paper rightly flags that, which is, which is the fact that as, as we're seeing a right wing vein of Hinduism kind of become more prominent in India, um, you're gonna have a reaction from the other side um, because they're gonna feel threatened, rightly or wrongly. Um, so I think that that's an interesting thing that, that they flagged in the paper. Um, and one of the things that I thought was super interesting that the paper goes into is that they looked at um, Uttar Pradesh and Muslims who are in Uttar Pradesh um, and how they tend to attack the state, and that's because they feel very disenfranchised. Um, they feel kind of that they're under threat, um, and so that is perhaps the reason why they're attacking the state, is because they see the state as, as being an oppressor, whereas in Kerala, as the paper po points out, they tend to actually feel that there's communal harmony and they wanna just go live in this utopia, um, that, uh, this caliphate. And I think that that also, that this divide between UP Muslims and Carolyn Muslims that the paper outlines and whether or not they feel you know, any attachment to their community um, also plays out when we look at like the numbers, for instance, of ISIS foreign fighters in the West. Um, the US, which has a much better track record of integrating immigrants, um, you only had about 70 fighters from uh, American fighters who joined to, uh, uh, who joined ISIS in, in Iraq and Syria, where is in, 
Western Europe with a similar population of the US and a terrible track record with you know, in integrating immigrants, you had about 4,500. So that's the thing to think about. Um, same thing with countries in the Middle East. Um, there aren't that many ISIS fighters from Lebanon, for instance, because Lebanese tend to be a lot more uh, moderate. Uh, you have the experience of different religions mixing, different cultures mixing. Um, whereas in Tunisia, you had 2,500, which is a huge number. Um, and I think that I went over the power of social media um, and also the Carolyn immigrants' experience to Saudi Arabia. I think that that's super important as well because that's something that we saw in the Middle East in the 70s and the 80s was a lot of Arabs going to Saudi Arabia to take part in the oil boom and help build buildings and serve as civil engineers or electrical engineers or whatever it is. And sometimes, and oftentimes they would come back um, with more radical thoughts than in their own home countries because I think that in India we tend to talk about West Asia like it's some amorphous blob, um, but actually West Asia or the Middle East is very different. So somebody who's Lebanese feels very different from Saudi or Tunisian or Moroccan. These are all very different countries with very different circumstances um, and very different radicalization trends. Um, I think one of the interesting things, and I'd love to kind of hear more about this as they do their research, is when I spoke to ISIS fighters um, that had left the caliphate, um, either they had been captured or they fled, uh, was this realization actually that the utopia that they had really hoped to go to um, and be a part of was actually just a big fraud. Um, I mean, obviously you had some die-hard uh, ISIS fighters who loved what was happening in the caliphate, but I think a lot, of, a lot of the more idealistic and less radical fighters tended to think that they were doing good, and when they came to Syria, they were quite shocked at how the local population was really under the thumb of foreign fighters. Um, foreign fighters, first of all, didn't trust a lot of the Syrian population because the Syrian, Syrians didn't join ISIS in huge droves. Oftentimes they were forced to because of a lot of different circumstances, one being the death of the rebel movement, the more secular-ish rebel movement. Um, and so ISIS would prey upon those fighters that had gone, for instance, to a big battle with um, Assad's forces in Syria, and then would basically hold them up at gunpoint and say, okay, well, you've been defeated by Assad's forces, so now join us or you're gonna be beheaded. So oftentimes, um, the Syrians were actually treated as second-class citizens. And oddly enough, the few South Asians that we, we, spoke, we spoke to and found in the caliphate were also treated as second-class citizens. Um, so there was this kind of hierarchy where Europeans were treated very well, Iraqis were treated very well because the leadership of ISIS is mostly Iraqi, um, Saudis were treated well because they had money, and then everybody else was just kind of like different tiers, second, third, fourth-class citizens. Um, so what has been interesting is watching how different governments are trying to take those stories and disseminate them and kind of beat ISIS on the online propaganda game by saying, look, you know, Abu Fadl, who was fighting in Raqqa, was caught and he has something to say about ISIS and here's Abu Fadl saying that, you know, it was all just a big lie and there was no harmony and there was corruption within ISIS um, and inequality among Muslims within ISIS. Um, but the thing is, is that how you disseminate that and get people to actually bite and believe it is going to be interesting because whatever comes out of, um, out of Western mouths is just not gonna be believed, unfortunately, by a subset of the population that's probably already radical and very uh, keen to hear these messages from, from um, Baghdadi or whomever comes next. So that is all I have to say. Thank you. Let me invite uh, Adil for, for his comments on this paper before we open this up for, you, for the audience. And so thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank ORF for inviting me to this uh, very nice seminar. And I've read the paper and I really liked it. Um, uh, I knew both of these scholars. I've been reading them for some time. And they've always, uh, but my expectations were very high. And uh, to some extent, they have been met in this paper. Uh, I think that uh, I would. Uh, be rather blunt in my reading of the paper, so there would be pluses and some issues which I personally have, which I would like to discuss, and I could be wrong in whatever 
suppositions I make here. Um, the, the good thing about the paper is that it is not just a primer. So when you put it there that it's a primer, uh, I think it says something more than that. It takes a position about Kerala that the uh, media or the narrative somehow is trying to project, which I completely agree with you, uh, that Kerala is somehow a more radical state than uh, the rest of India, just on the basis of uh, a few more uh, people going in larger numbers, probably, uh, proportionately, from the state of Kerala. Because there are many other dimensions to uh, measuring radicalization than just uh, how many people left for ISIS. I think that many more states have uh, more communal tensions, uh, more uh, issues of uh, potential radicalization. Uh, it's just that it is manifesting at this point in time more in the state of Kerala. So I think that uh, whenever I meet a Keralaite, I find that uh, there is a greater camaraderie and uh, amongst the population. So that, that is something which is uh, very well brought out. The other thing which uh, stands out there is um, that uh, Salafism should not be taken as a monolith, which is a very good point which has been made here. And we'll come to that later. But somehow when I read the paper, the title of the paper is Islamic State in India's Kerala, a primer. Now, when I read India's Kerala, maybe it is for the larger international audience, but <laughs> to me it seems that probably there are other Keralas because when I was in Dubai, I was there in UAE for 17 years. So there, uh, the first time I met a Keralaite, I asked him because I had just come that, uh, what is the demographics of the place? He said, number one is a Keralaite, number two is an Indian, number three is a Pakistani. So I was taken aback that Kerala is somehow not. So maybe there's a Dubai Kerala and there's a Singapore Kerala, I don't know. Probably you could have, in my opinion, worded it differently, particularly because you are also raising very important other issues which probably should have been highlighted in the title. Uh, the, the thing that um, uh, stands out is uh, India right now has very good relations with Saudi Arabia and Gulf countries. We have about uh, 8 million odd Indian uh, working there. Uh, we are also going to have temples in many of those countries in the GCC. So when you uh, uh, brand a particular sect as, as, uh, as the good guy or the bad guy, this is not what it should be. Um, and nowadays you find that the so-called Wahhabi Qatar having an issue with the Wahhabi Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so you find that there are many more nuances than a very uh, bland understanding of things actually. Uh, so that's, that's something which is uh, wonderful about the paper. However, I have uh, this issue with when, when you are trying to overcome these, uh, these narratives and how they are created. Uh, there should not be a political st uh, slant to that. I mean, you're saying that people who went from Kerala to Syria went there to serve the so-called caliphate, and uh, people from the UP or from northern India uh, were more prone to violence. Maybe, uh, as of now, many people who have come back from uh, from Kerala, or, or they may not have indulged in acts of violence, but anyone who goes to ISIS, I mean, that ISIS plan is to actually disrupt the entire international order, and it has problems even with the Salafis, even with the radical Sururi Salafis, it deem, uh, deems them as murtad. So, <laughs> so a person coming back from that, maybe these people, when they had left, or maybe the families you may have interviewed, they may have said that they've only gone there because of certain of that, but when they come back, you cannot uh, say that uh, a Keralaite ISIS guy would not be doing such activities because he's uh, very, uh, you know, having feelings for the uh, fellow Keralaite of different faiths. That does not quite, I mean, accord. I think it could be looked into. Uh, uh, the other thing is that. Uh, uh, We, we need to understand that India is going through, has three different kinds of jihad going on. There is an internal Indian Muslim community which comes out with its own problems and thinks of doing some kind of a jihad. Then you have the Pakistan-backed jihad. Then you have the third one is the global jihadist. Now, what we have been suffering mostly is Pakistan-backed jihad. We have had a few organizations like Simi and Indian Mujahideen who come up and uh, most of them get subsumed by these other two. So some people, because of certain local grievances or whatever, they may uh, come up and form groups. Ultimately, they are taken over by either park backed uh, groups or, or the global jihadists. 
the the thing is that i have been reading other papers also and it seems that there is a kind of a apologist approach towards muslims no muslims have been very nice we have not been as bad as uh, we have uh, you know since independence we have had a lot of rioting in the country <laughs> across the geography we have had attacks in bombay twice uh, in 93 and 2008 and then attack on parliament in 2001 so it is not that the indian muslim has been less violent per se it is just that when it comes to joining al qaeda and isis that has not been to the level perhaps uh, fortunately to the extent that we feared it might be so what we should look at is why the indian muslim has not joined the global jihadists as much he, he may have joined uh, pakistani uh, groups when they have been conducting attacks here in bombay or other places or they may have been in uh, active in kashmir or other places whatever rioting or whatever sort it's not that the indian muslim is uh, is not radical or the indian i would say in the indian population is also quite extreme in its way of thinking. It's just that uh, we are not so violent in our actions. In our ideology, we are probably, I would say, more extreme than, than even the Arabs. But we have, uh, we have a great spirit of survival, and we don't have a stamina for violence. Uh, <laughs> if you go for war with uh, Pakistan, we can last only 10 days after that. We, so it's, it's that our sustainability of, of <coughs> violence is not that high. I mean, this is my conjecture. Uh, you can question me on that. Uh, so. <laughs> So I think uh, we, we need to understand that uh, in North India has been slightly immune to uh, the Al-Qaeda ISIS propaganda. What are the reasons for that? And why Kerala is probably an exception. Uh, Kerala has always been close to the uh, Arab world, uh, close to uh, the Western world as such. And when you find the Maplas, uh, if you read their history, and I'm very glad that you have given a very good account of that history. The Maplas were the people who were actually uh, thrown out of business by the Portuguese. And, and that was happening at a time when the Spanish Inquisition was happening and Portuguese. So unlike the British, who were not so uh, passionately, religiously driven in whatever they were doing, uh, the Portuguese were. And so that rivalry which was happening between the Arab traders and the Portuguese, that has had a significant impact on the psyche, collective psyche of the Mapla the few people I have uh, seen. And right now, we are having a movie which is going to be made with Sunil Shetty as the hero, which talks about a Mapla Muslim ruler fighting off the Portuguese. It's the, um, I think, Kunjali Marakkar is that movie. It's coming up. So it is very much there in the collective psyche. That's why you are going to make a movie out of it and make money out of it. So there is a residual hatred towards the European Christendom. It's not towards the Keralaite Christendom, but European Christendom within the Muslim narrative. They were the people who suffered most. Uh, their uh, hegemony over trade at the time of the Zamorin and other rulers, they suffered and they have been suffering throughout. And if you also see in 1921, though the Mapla revolts took place since the 1850s, it was in 1921 that you had the biggest Mapla revolt. That was the result of the caliphate movement, the Khilafat movement. So the idea of restitution of caliphate. If you read the ISIS literature, ISIS literature talks about Arab, Western, or Muslim, Islamic, or Christian struggle. They talk more about crusades than they talk about Israel. So for them, the, uh, the al malham al-Kubra, the great war, where uh, even their magazines are, uh, first was Dabiq, which starts the, the big war, and the second one was Rumiya. They have always talked about attacking the Vatican. So they want to start a war with Christendom. They don't accept the point that the West has moved on from Christianity. They still want to go for a. That's why they attacked Sri Lanka. You had the Easter bombings. Uh, so, attack, so, so when you read ISIS literature, it talks about hatred towards the Western uh, Christendom. And that may have a greater resonance in the, in the minds of the Keralite who have had that history of restituting the caliphate and the Western Christendom, rather than uh, the North Indian Muslim who's mainly struggling with the Hindus on various issues. So I think that is why there is a distinction. The other thing is that the North Indian Muslim are primarily Hanafi Sunni Muslims. And the whole Wahhabi movement, uh, the whole, I, I should call it uh, Salafi movement, uh, there has been a, uh, Wahhabis have subsumed themselves into that when I'm, anyway. 
the followers of Abdul Wahhab, if I may put it, Wahhabis don't like to call themselves Wahhabis, they call themselves Salafis. Uh, but uh, that movement, Wahhabi mo uh, Salafi movement, is against Abu Hanifa, who wrote the first jurisprudential book. And when they say that we are going back to the Salafis because the generation of Abu Hanifa, according to them, made innovations in writing the laws of Islam. So the first fundamental problem of uh, Wahhabis has been the Hanafi Muslims. And it is for this reason that Taliban has not been given the acceptance of an Islamic emirate by the Salafis. Uh, OK, bin Laden was more of a pan-Islamist, so he had no problems. But within Al-Qaeda, you had people uh, like uh, um, Abu Qartada and uh, like uh, uh, Zarqawi, and there was a huge opposition that do not accept Taliban as an Islamic emirate because Talibanis are Deobandi Hanafi fighters. It's, it's the sad thing that we have not been able to uh, create a wedge in our, and I mean, if you look at Lashkar-e Tayyaba, which is uh, Ahle Hadith uh, uh, Salafi, uh, uh, and between uh, uh, Jaisi Muhammad, which is a Deobandi, which are actually doctrinally opposed to each other. Because we do not appreciate these differences, our security agencies uh, possibly lack a trick here. So I, I think it is important to find out uh, why in the subcontinent, uh, from an Indian point of view. The other thing is that the, when, when ISIS talks about an Islamic state, India, Indian Muslim has already gone through that experiment. This is nothing new. We have had the creation of Pakistan, and we have suffered the consequences. So it does not resonate as much. We are already uh, going through that uh, thing. So it, uh, unlike in Europe or other places where the idea of an Islamic state would resonate more, the Taliban experiment and the Pakistan experiment is before us. So it does not resonate. The other thing is that the Indian uh, Muslim has his own set of scholars and his own set of doctrinal Islam. Devbandi, uh, Darul Ulum Devband is not just a college. It is uh, Ashari, Maturidi, Sunni Muslim. And it has its own take on theology. So which actually has an effect on most Central Asian countries. Even Taliban is a Devbandi. So even when you go to Afghanistan, you have a Devbandi influence there. So Indian Islam has been on par with West Asian Islam. When you talk of Maududi, when you talk of Muslim Brotherhood, does not have a branch in India. Why? Because the founder of, uh, founders of Muslim Brotherhood, like Hassan al-Banna and Maududi, have acknowledged the contribution of uh, Maududi. Uh, uh, Hassan al-Banna and Sayyid Qutub have, in their books, acknowledged the contribution of Maududi. So when Maududi's jamaat islami has a huge sway over India, Muslim Brotherhood has no space for that here. They may be there in, in uh, maybe Malaysia or Indonesia or Africa or wherever. Muslim Brotherhood may have branches, but they don't have it here. The West Asian Islam, both radical and moderate, has been typically Indian. And the Indian Muslim takes great pride in his version of Islam, which I think even the Indian Hindus do not know about much. So that ha So the idea that we will subserve the Arab organizations does not resonate much. We hold our own. Uh, I think these points are important to understand why Kerala has been, because it has not been part. The other thing is we speak the Urdu language more. Even for our religious literature, we go to Urdu leaders. We have our own scholars. We talk of Ashraf Thanvi, or we will talk of uh, uh, Shah Waliullah Dehelvi, uh, or Ahmad Shah Sarhindi. Uh, we will not talk about Ghazali or about Ibn Taymiyyah, <laughs> we don't even know them. So we have our own subset of theologians and, and, and thinking process, which I will not say is moderate. There may be moderates and there may be extreme. So you find the Pakistani militancy and jihadism, but it is running, it borrows something and it gives something. Uh, if you look at the first literature against Sufism, although Ibn Taymiyyah came out against Sufi Islam, but doctrinally, the idea of Wahdatul Shuhud in opposition to the Sufi idea of Wahdatul Wujud came from India. It was the Ahmad Shah Sarhindi follower, Abdul Hayat, who was the teacher of uh, Abdul Wahhab. So Wahhabism's founder 
had his teacher Abdul Wahab from Sindh of India. So the thing that for many Indian Islamic scholars, it does not resonate so much because like uh, many Indian Hindu scholars, when you talk to them about Einstein and about other things and about even Wahhabi and Salafi, they say, yeah, Wahhabi Salafi is same like Advaitwad or Dvaitwad. We, we, we know everything. We are too smug about, okay, we know it. We have not been able to build on it, but we, we have all these ideas. So, uh, so it is because of these reasons, these cultural reasons, that uh, that kind of a symmetry has not happened. However, it may happen in the future because this young generation of Muslim does not know the difference between Wahhabi and Devbandi and all that. They, they try to learn everything from Sheikh Google, as one of my friend Ali uh, Mahmoud Abadi says. And they, because the Wahhabi website will not say that uh, I'm, I'm Wahhabi. They will say this is Islam. So they will take everything and they might move in that direction. But we need to have this differentiated approach while uh, I think I'll stop here because I'll carry on. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think uh, this is the time to open this up for your questions, comments, observations, and please, um, uh, you know, yeah, please, and please use the mic. It's a requirement <laughs> for those who are at the back. Uh, and uh, please direct your questions if, if they are to the authors or to the discussants. Please uh, make it clear. Yes, sir. Ms. Vinod Sagal, two short questions to the New York Times uh, journalist, one to the main speaker and one to the last. You are from Lebanon. I was there 52 years ago. My question is that both uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, they have been successful in keeping out uh, these influences to come into Lebanon and uh, Palestine. Is that correct? Second question. You said that most of the leaders of uh, ISIS are Iraqis. Were they the same people who broke away, which were part of the Saddam Azam army? No. These two from you? One from, she mentioned about uh, Arabic influence, Arabic language. About five years ago, there was an Arabic publisher, a lady. She published one of my books translated into Arabic in Delhi. So she told me that the largest amount of Arabic is being taught in Kerala than anywhere else. It's proliferated. Is that in any way going to make an influence? And last, I've enjoyed your clarifications. Have you ever uh, debated with Arif Mahmud Khan, the governor of Kerala now? Well, my name is Surender, and uh, my major of history from the university. Um, well, thank you for the email. I just got it, and it was my off. I thought, okay, be, you know, rather than sleeping, I'll just come here. Um, so, uh, Adil has covered a lot of stuff that I was actually planning to bombard you with, but I mean, just a few points. Uh, so, I got really interested with the, the title of the paper that is going to talk about the Kerala. And Maria said quite correctly that you know. There have been a lot of studies on Western part of it, like what was the influence and all, but in particular about India. Uh, sorry, my apologies. So, uh, I mean, so your paper deals specifically with Kerala, and uh, really wanted to know. So Adil has covered a lot of it, but I mean, what I found missing, and maybe let's say an area of opportunity, I mean, Vice has done a lot of great work. New York Times has done a lot of great work on what goes into thinking of what ISIS actually wants, not just in India, I mean, it could be anywhere. There's this really wonderful article by uh, Green Wood on Atlantic, what does ISIS really want? It went to become, let's say, one of the best read. I, uh, I mean, the connection between Al Jawahari and all the people and what are the differences, the internet differences we have, and what, uh, you know, uh, how they could impact Indians as well. So I found that missing from the part. I was really hoping that they would be there. Uh, I mean, Hussein Haqqani, the former ambassador to US for Pakistan, um, 
Um, there is this last one as well, uh, Tariq Fateh. He has written a lot about the Miraj of Pakistan and a lot of those theological arguments that the same, I mean, those arguments can be applied specifically to Indian Muslim uh, on pan-Indian level. I found those arguments missing as well, um, which could have served as really good starting points. Uh, and my own understanding is a lot of them, thank you, Adil as well, it, it is borrowed from those people as well. So I found that missing and I, I would really request you to please See if we can use some of that because I think, even though it's based on North India and all, but uh, being the part of Caroline, the your paper, the title, is uh, a huge general stroke. It deals with the huge that you have on the table. If we are unable to deal with that, with the kind of substances that you need to provide, wouldn't be such a good idea for me. Thank you. That's all. So, you know, on, on this point, you know, um, one of the things about this paper is that this is part of a larger project in ISIS. So we have done a lot. Of, I don't know how, how far uh, you've seen that uh, those kind of those works that we have published before. So I think you have to contextualize that in that context also. That every time you can't be re you, you can't be repeating the things that you have said earlier. Some of the some of the things uh, in that context matter. But just clarification, I think. Were, uh, yes. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, uh, this is for Kabir actually. Uh, you you said something about counterterrorism policy. You mixed up Kashmir with uh, Kerala. I, I I would keep Kashmir out of it completely because Kashmir is not really a counterterror uh, situation. It's an insurgency, so it's got a completely different uh, way of looking at it. The second uh, smaller point I have is a question of context. I mean, international fighters in ISIS. I think number about four or five thousand. I don't know, or maybe a bit more. Uh, you've had the Spanish Civil War in which the International Brigade had 59,000 fighters. The Americans in that were some around 3,000 fighters who fought. And out of that, the FBI finally, when they went back after beating, getting defeated, only two of them were under investigation for anything. So, I mean, it's in, the, in, in the question of context, yes, uh, internet and TV have made things much bigger than what they actually are. So, I, I just... Um, uh, all right. So, Hezbollah and Hamas. Um, so, I would say that I can't. Okay, so Hezbollah's role actually when it came to ISIS was very different than I think. Um, Hezbollah was fighting inside Syria against ISIS. Okay, uh, and other insurgent groups that were not, or Syrian rebel groups that weren't necessarily radical Islamists. But anyway, um, so Hezbollah itself, uh, while it does have the Lebanese state quite locked down in terms of intel intelligence, I mean, also Lebanon is just very different. Like, Lebanon has, I lived on a street that was eight kilometers and filled with bars and open air bars. Um, you know, the experience of the average Lebanese Muslim is very different than the Saudi Muslim, for instance. I mean, Lebanon is a, a very open place. I mean, what women wear in Lebanon scandalizes me constantly. It's worse than Miami Beach. Um, so, you know, it's a very open and vibrant place, as you know, because you were there 52 years ago. Um, so I think that, that more so than Hezbollah locking down Lebanon, I think it was more just the average Sunni Lebanese not being that keen to go to, to um, Syria. What's been interesting, though, is that you have a lot of Lebanese immigrants, Sunni immigrants, to Australia, and they tend to be quite radical. And that's the reason being because uh, their immigration experience has not been very good in Australia. And this is kind of what goes to the core of why people join ISIS, which they, you know, which they were able to get into in their paper, which is when people feel like they don't belong, they tend to want to join something bigger. And I had many conversations with people who said that they were, you know, uh, uh, dedicated Sunnis fighting in Syria, and I would speak to them and say, okay, well, tell me, what is the, like, hadith for this thing that you're talking about? And they would never be able to actually say, to quote their own scripture to say, to, to justify the actions that they were doing, their own Islamic scripture. And they'd always say, Google it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and for instance, some of the like I, some of the some of those that had tried to join ISIS from the UK, what did they have in their bags? They had hiking gear and ISIS for dummies, or sorry, not ISIS, Islam for dummies, which is actually like a, a book that 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 is an easier to read, you know, explainer of the Quran. So these are not exactly like you know high minds of uh, Isla high minded Islamic scholars who are showing up. Um, oftentimes these are people who were kind of like to put it bluntly they were kind of losers um, and they felt like you know they needed something bigger in their lives they wanted to belong and what is the best belonging that you could have possibly is joining a caliphate not to say that there aren't people who are Muslim scholars who were you know pro ISIS but I'm just saying that it's it's varying degrees we can't just paint it with one brush um, so, uh, so I would say that that would probably explain the Hezbollah thing, is that it's not that Hezbollah prevented people from going, it was just their experience in Lebanon, which is much more kind of liberal. Um, on Iraq's army pre-Saddam, yes, there was evidence, I mean, because basically what was ISIS? ISIS was basically Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And then they formed, they moved to Syria once there was a security vacuum there with the outbreak of the Arab Spring. And what happened was they basically, there was a fight between um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and um, the head of Al-Qaeda in Syria right now, whose name is escaping me, Adnani. No, Adnani. Anyway. Um, and they were both contesting, well, who was the head of, of Al-Qaeda in Syria? And eventually, um, Zawahiri came down and said, Baghdadi, your people are supposed to be in Iraq. You should have nothing to do with Syria. Let the Syrians have their Al Qaeda, and you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna subsume this Al Qaeda movement in Syria. And then what happened was Baghdadi then formed ISIS. So ISIS came out of, of Al Qaeda. Baghdadi himself was, you know, an Iraqi who was, um, who was, who was thrown in Camp Bukha, which was a notorious American-run military. Uh, uh, American military run prison, and he was radicalized there, which is also part of the reason why a lot of European countries don't want to take back their ISIS fighters. I mean, I broke a story about the French special forces actually trying to hunt down French citizens in Mosul and trying to execute them actually before they could be, they could go to try to claim asylum back, in, or not claim asylum, but try to get back to France. Because A, it's very hard to actually say that you've committed a crime because joining ISIS in a lot of countries is actually not quite a crime yet. It's actually committing, a, a, or it's a crime, but it's a crime that's only prosecutable by like two or three years or four years. But if you behead somebody, obviously that's a crime, right? And that's life imprisonment. But it's very hard to then say that this French citizen beheaded somebody in Mosul or Raqqa or Derzur or wherever, right? Because they're not exactly gonna have evidence of that. So if they were to go back to France or they go back to the UK or they go back to the States, it'd be very hard to actually say that these people have committed such egregious crimes that they have to be, you know, lock, lock, throw them in jail and, lock, and throw away the key. Um, so we found a lot of, actual, like, we found lots of European countries just trying to execute them before they could even get back to their countries. Because also the other thing is that they then go into prison and then they radicalize, radicalize other prisoners, which is what they believe happened with Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. He was thrown in for a small crimes demeanor by the American military, came out of that prison very radicalized, probably by some, you know, jihadi who took his ear. Um, Sure. The second question was, yeah. a lot of Iraqis that joined ISIS first were from the Pakistan disbanded army because that's how the military victories came so far. Are they still there? Iraqis. Oh, Iraqs. Oh, sorry. They were yeah. not from the Pakistan, sorry, from the Iraqi disbanded army by the Americans. They a lot were of people who joined. Yeah. And their military skills were put to effective use. Yeah. Are those people still in command? Because their ideology under Saddam was more open, liberal. 
Yeah, it was more, well, no, actually, so this is the thing, is that actually Saddam was at the very beginning kind of secular, yes. but then he actually then turned to be very, very, um, he tried to embrace Islam as a means to try to, 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 to boost his legitimacy. So actually the last like five or six years of his, no, more than that, but the last like 10 or 15 years of his, of his rule was marked by actually incredible suppression against the Shias because the Shias tried to rise against him. Uh, but anyway, so so what was once a secular army actually then ended up becoming quite um, uh, Sunni. But yes, that infrastructure is still there. But a lot of these these guys are quite old now. So, but what they've done is that they have they've handed down their knowledge of what it was like to be in a uniform army, uh, conventional army. And so that's why ISIS is so well organized. And so that so so they might not be heading the ranks of ISIS because they're quite old. But what they've done is pass down the knowledge. So anyway. I met uh, Arif Mamad Khan. Yes. <laughs> so I have to debate it. Debate it. Debate it. Debate it. Debate it. Debate it. He didn't say anything, so that means he agreed. Uh, but he, he did refer to uh, the Mutazilla. Uh, I, was, uh, I was wrong with the century of the Mutazilla uh, coming up with the Abbasid Caliphate and all that. So he said it is not in the 10th century, it's in the 9th century itself. So, you, uh, so I said, yes, you are right. Because he's very well read, and so he corrected he me on that. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, so I think I'll just limit myself to that. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to both the panelists for the for the comments. Just a very quick note on the title of the thing is just for a broader audience. There's no just so that if someone is reading it in Alberta, Canada, they know what they're like. Right, very simple. And uh, to the gentleman there also, if this is the fourth paper in the series. So if you go back and read the first couple of them, yeah. So you'll find the uh, context that you were looking for for from that part. Maybe you need to speak a bit less, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come, come here more often. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, sir, uh, point taken on the CT and insurgency thing. Yeah, you, you're correct there. But I'll quickly get Sinan in, who wanted to make a couple of uh, points on the feedback by Dr. Dr. Rashid. Sinan, can you hear me? Right. Yeah. yeah I can please go hear ahead. you. Yeah. Uh, shall I speak? Yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. OK. All right, um, so I just wanted to thank both the panelists and also whoever asked the questions. Again, I agree with uh, Kabir's point very well taken on the counter-terrorism versus counter-insurgency in Kashmir. Um, second, with uh, some of Maria's comments, I think I really, um, it was quite like you know instructive in terms of um, especially when she mentioned this issue of uh, South Asians being treated badly and and you would find some uh, you would find some news reports in India that have also showed this specifically with Indians um, which I think in my opinion have acted as uh, uh, you know impediments to people wanting to join because at the end of the day if they feel that this utopia is what they're going to go join in a place like Islamic State, but uh, they don't get it over there because Indians are treated badly, they are unsuspecting suicide bombers, they're made to clean toilets or cook food. Like all of these are good reasons why people say, you know, not really what I want to sign up for, right? So um, that's something that I wanted to point out. But I think, you know, and and I wanted to just comment a little bit on the issue of ideology because I agree with Dr. Adil Rashid. Like I think, and and we've had this discussion previously as well um, in in Delhi when he, you know where he spoke about like you know the Wahhabi ideology Diobandi and so on and so forth but there's something that I want to point out to the audience right now and I think that it, it is largely you know it is largely glossed over by many analysts right the Diobandi movement the Ahli Hadith movement, which exists up north, which is the Salafis, right? Uh, the Barelvi movement, which is also mostly up north, and also jamaat e islam right? All of these four organizations have originated in India. They have different versions in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in uh, even in Kashmir, for that matter, and in the rest of India, in, in hinterland India, as it's called, right? And um, what you would notice is that they have the same set of theological beliefs, they have the same set of problems with, let's say, for example, the Ahli Hadiths do not like Shias, they always have problems with Deoband, you would see debates happening between them, both in Pakistan and India and so on. But what you don't see is that in in India, they haven't, you know, adapted, uh, adopted violence, right? I mean, there, there are beliefs that, and there are issues, you know, uh, fundamental issues that you can have with them as maybe, you know, in, in, in the perspective of secularism or liberal values and so on. But, uh, but in terms of political values and in terms of violence, there has been a lack of adoption among Indian agency, uh, Indian uh, organizations, whereas in Pakistan, there have been, a, uh, you know, a higher tendency. And, and I think that 
this sort of points out to the fact that ideology cannot always be the biggest uh, aspect that you look at. You also have to look at what the political situation around it has um, you know, dictated. So that's one point I wanted to make. And the second point, and, and I'll close with the second point, uh, you're right about foreign fighters returning back, right? This is Dr. Adil Rashid when he said that um, Kerala foreign fighters won't really care about the state and so on when they come back. And, and I think Mohammed Hafiz, as well as Thomas Heghammer and David Mallet have spoken about how people who came back from the Afghan Jihad, they did end up, you know, bringing forth a lot of ideology and so on. And that's different from people going and just working as economic migrants in uh, a place like, you know, Saudi Arabia and UAE. Because uh, I've had family members who worked in these places and, you know, they don't come back with radical ideas as such. But when you have a population that is going to go take part in a so-called international jihad, which happened between the 80s and the 90s, and then when you come back from there, or even in this case with 2014 uh, with the ISIS and so on, then when you come back, then you're liable to, you know, spread that ideology and also spread the training. It's not just about ideology. It's also the fact that they have maybe bomb training expertise, organizational expertise, and so on and so forth, right? So we didn't find people who came back from Kerala, or maybe those reports were very less. They were not out on open source. And, you know, that may be one limitation we had. That's one of the reasons why we didn't focus on it, right? But also that could give you a clue as to why you don't have people from, you know, from India who haven't joined the conflict abroad because if you think about it there are not many people who joined the afghan jihad from india and uh, there were many reasons for it I'm, I'm exploring all of this in a different paper but the idea is that these are two aspects that need to be considered by audiences and i i feel that especially you know among indian papers i find this lack of like you know contextualization as well as um, these aspects that are glossed over so ideology may be over exaggerated at times and the second being that uh, you need to look at other operational means such as returning foreign fighters and i agree with dr adil rashid in that um, sense thank you i completely agree with you ideology is not the main thing and i think organization is as important as ideology and Absolutely. when it comes to North Indian Muslims, they have not had any political leaders or any political parties. Unfortunately, I mean, for sure, I mean, we don't know. Kerala has had more kind of mass mobilization political parties and other groups, overt and covert. Uh, that has not happened in North India. That could also be one of the reasons why, uh, though there may be some simmering discontent, there has not been a, a mobilization of that. So I completely agree with you on that. I think that this submission this was in regards to this aspect of insurgency and counter terrorism. Uh, I don't have anyone to go to, so I've, I've been part of uh, the Indian security establishment uh, for almost close to three decades now uh, and having served in Kashmir itself. Uh, I can assure you, sir, that uh, from my personal first hand experience, what we have seen there since early 1990, that while it started as a militancy, it has always been a terrorist act. I mean, it's been terrorism that we have been seeing, which has grown, it has been sustained, it has been supported, it has been provisioned all the way. Why, yes, there have been local resources whom we are now calling as insurgents, but they have always been there. Even today, sir, as late as maybe just last week, every infiltration that takes place, we have foreign fighters who are coming in. And foreign fighters are the people who lead each track. While the Kashmiris are there, people who are disbanded, as, uh, 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 as the lady just mentioned, while it is there, anywhere, I mean, be it Kashmir, be it Kerala, be it Caliphate, all these people, while the top hierarchy may have pe people who are absolutely focus on some 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 particular theology. Most of the ground workers are those who are failures, who are losers, who are looking for some kind of a sustenance and who want to fight against the society. So getting back to the main issue, sir, Kashmir is not incidency. Kashmir is a proper full developed case of terrorism and it's developing faster than we can imagine. And we have linkages from Kashmir to maybe Caliphate to maybe Kerala. I mean, to say that they are different, I would rather differ. Yeah, One question. Uh, it was my impression that there is also some uh, amount of ISIS 
activity in Tamil Nadu and that there was a connection to uh, the Sri Lankan uh, bombing. Uh, how is this related to, uh, to uh, your findings in, in, in Kerala, if there is any relation? question is that uh, what do you think about the relationship between uh, uh, Kerala IS and uh, Simi in North India? A second thing is that you, we all discuss uh, now only Kerala issues, but in Assam is growing the footprints of IS in special district on uh, Nalbari and Golpara district. So, could you repeat the last one, please? Nalbari district in Assam. What do you think about the growing footprints of IS? Round, so if I have questions, comments, observations, if there are any before I go to the floor. I'll just jump in. Uh, and just quickly picking up on um, comments that were made earlier, including by uh, Sinan, on the issue of returning foreign fighters in Kerala. Um, we spoke a little bit about the risk, but I'd be curious for your sense um, of whether sort of you got the impression that the government was seized, the security forces in Kerala were seized of the potential risk. Uh, and whether we're seeing that sort of through de-radicalization programs or outreach to local communities in Kerala, that, that sort of whole network. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I mean, starting from the, I'll just quickly start from the Tamil Nadu thing. Uh, there's, there's some, you know, data there which says that Tamil Nadu has seen more cases than actually any other Indian, Indian state. But, uh, uh, of course, it, it came into it came into context with the Sri Lankan uh, uh, bombings that happened uh, in April. We haven't done. We, I mean, this was this paper was already in process process of coming out when that happened. So we haven't done any sort of comparative. What were the linkages or something? We, we we were unable to go down that road. But that's something that's been there for a while. It's not that there not there are no linkages and stuff. There were a couple of reports also that you know some of the people who took part in in the bombings actually were traveled here and there were some, I mean, a lot of these reports were uncorroborated and based on sources. And I think there were a lot of games being played between the agencies as well at that point of time. So uh, clearly th there, are, there have been cases, the first Indian pro ISIS case in, in India that came uh, to, to court at least uh, was in Tamil Nadu uh, of, a, of a person who was deported from Singapore. So, uh, uh, but this particular, in this particular piece, we haven't gone through the linkages, so I can't really uh, expand on it for, for the time being. Uh, the gentleman asked on uh, Simi, was it? Was it uh, yeah. I mean, there's not a lot, let's be honest. I mean, there are a couple of former Indian Mujahideen, former Indian, like uh, after his breakout, uh, people who were uh, uh, attached to uh, Islamic State and some of them who even managed to go to Afghanistan and, uh, and make, uh, make uh, use of what Hindi was a former Indian Mujahideen fellow. But other than two or three sporadic cases, it, it's not a it, it, it's not a concern. Uh, and Assam again, like I mentioned in West Bengal earlier as well, it's very easy to create this non-existent existence of a, a group like Islamic State, right? Uh, as I said, the West Bengal case uh, of uh, an emir in West Bengal by Islamic State, which was carried by various national newspapers without any background of how this works or how it goes. Uh, and once you, but, but, but the brand, as I said, is so strong. Once you release something like that in public discourse, whether it's true or not, it will become true at certain level. So I, again, uh, Assam is something that we have studied briefly as well. I don't see any ecosystems there that uh, one should be worried about. So, uh, I, and I think Sinan was the last question. Sinan? Uh, the yeah, last question. Um, I think just, I mean, I think you've covered Tamil Nadu, ISIS, um, and Simi, as well as Assam quite properly. Um, on the question of the returning foreign fighters, right, um, I don't think, spec okay, again, I think you have to keep in context or keep in mind that at least it has been reported um, that most people who did go to Kerala have sort of died, especially in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, those, the, the, like, it's, I think um, Stanley John covered it in his book on the ISIS Caliphate, right? Um, and if they've died then there's obviously no returning foreign fighters from there and even if the numbers come it would not be in you know I, you need a larger number of people to be able to influence things but that said um, when you asked about de-radicalization initiatives and so on, I think um, the Kerala police, you know, there was this, we referred to it in our paper, the Operation Pigeon, 
as it's called um and i don't know who chooses the names for these uh, operations but um the point is that uh, it was an interesting one at least in terms of numbers that were you know allegedly put out there are 350 people who were interested in joining or who were radicalized i don't know what the measures were i don't know how accurate the numbers were but you know this is what we read and uh, one of the things they did was they worked with the both the local imams and they worked with um family members and they worked with community leaders to ensure that these people don't join and and i think i want to like you know put that in context as uh, you know coming from again a muslim family myself right when you in indian muslim family myself when we think about like you know how and we know that in india a lot of families are very closely knit so if you do hear of such activities taking place right there is an rajnath singh has commented on this before where muslims themselves go ahead and talk to uh rajnath or like you know the home office and so on saying that well look there there is someone from my family who is interested in joining isis right and this is another thing that you can put in later on about why indians don't join um with such a large close knit family they will ensure or they will do their best to ensure that you don't go and like i think maria pointed out right at the beginning was that um families and kinship ties are really important this is a strand of literature that exists in terrorism studies and and without kinship ties you really cannot push it forward right so uh, these are all aspects that the kerala police considered in their uh, deradicalization initiative and i think they used it quite effectively and this was also used in the case of saifullah who uh, was in in bihar or uttar pradesh i forget but he was supposedly there was an encounter of sorts and they called his father to plead with him before before they finally he he said i won't uh, surrender and then they finally had to shoot him dead right so these these are some very effective points um, that are brought about by uh, indian police uh, agencies especially in kerala and so on you know so maybe there are other shortcomings but this i think is a good development that's taken place as of recently and maybe that i hope answers the uh, comment or the musings of the person who had asked this question uh we have had a uh, very poor relations between the uh, sri lankan muslims and uh, the buddhist uh, groups the uh, and uh, we have had a base movement uh, linked to al qaeda in tamil nadu which was we don't know whether it is still existing or not but uh, there have been pictures coming out of this so there have been these uh, activities happening in tamil nadu uh, talking about the plight of muslims in sri lanka and all and even with the ltt there have uh, developed issues uh, of late so so that is uh, something which is brewing and so we should not uh, we should also focus on tamil nadu it's a, it's a whole game in itself because of the sri lanka issue so with that thank you so much and uh, i think this is a conversation that is not going to end today so we can we can expect more such conversations in the coming years um, but thank you all for coming and thank you uh, thanks to the two authors who have Done a great job with this paper, and I feel I think there there are more. There's much more here to cover, as the two discussants have pointed out. So all the best to you, and thank you.